Thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, as we think about the uh, fixed income market, uh, there's a lot of debate out there whether um, we're in a disinflationary environment still, um, whether deflation is potentially upon the horizon, and also potentially do we get a reflation in the overall economy with some of the strength out there. And so um, I wanted to put that on investors' minds um, as we look through it. And there's a story for everyone in today's market with the economic data. And what I think that means is that you've got to play for multiple outcomes in this environment. And so, as always, I'll start with the macroeconomic update. Uh, I was torturing myself and listening uh, to this uh, to the the videos at the beginning and and listening to myself uh, on video and recordings. And it's pretty interesting to to think through how uh, the environment hasn't really changed over the last couple of months since some of those recordings were taking place. And so, I want to walk through how the data has materialized. I'll get you some up-to-date thinking on, on what the team is doing here at Double Lime, and most importantly, uh, some ideas on how to implement some of those views as well. And so uh, if you followed our work here, you know I like to start off with thinking about the trend in the overall economy. And I still think this chart is, is a very good way of describing where we are ultimately in our long-term economic cycles. And you know, as investors, you know, we can invest uh, thinking about the cycle for the overall long-term but I think this paints a very good picture of the regime shifts that we've seen over the last few years. And so you see the long-term trend in the post-World War II era, the slope of that line is the growth rate. It used to have, used to lead with a 3% number on real GDP and post GFC, we saw that number be about 2.3%. And if you look at the dotted line there, that shows you the trend line. And again, because it's a logarithmic scale, uh, the, the slope of that line is actually the growth rate. And you can see there that if you take that, that trend line, that dotted red area, what you actually see is that the economy is actually outperforming that trend. And uh, that has been because of a lot of the, the stimulus that we generated uh, in the economy, both from the fiscal side, uh, potentially the monetary policy being too stimulated for too long. Uh, but the economic cycle is continuing today. And so if you look at it, if you recall, last year was the most forecasted recession in the history of mankind. Um, and as usual, the market really throws egg in all of our faces when we get a very strong consensus one way or the other. And pretty interestingly, um, you know, the uh, economists were still from the standpoint of thinking that this, this hiking cycle is going to play out. It's going to derail growth rates. And so even though growth in their minds got pulled forward in 2023, it was going to come home to roost in 2024. And in fact, at one point, the forecast for 2024 GDP was around 40 basis points on the consensus for the entire year. And if you think about what happened in the first quarter of, uh, of 2024, uh, we haven't got the data yet. We'll get that in about, um, in about 10 days or so. Uh, but the estimates out there are that it grew on an annualized basis north of 2%. And so, um, again, if you think about what economists were thinking, you know, roughly, let's call it five months ago or so, or six months ago, um, that the economy probably grew as much in the first quarter as, as was thought to be for the entire overall 2024. And so this has been because of a lot of the resilience in the data set. Um, I'll go through uh, a fair amount of, of, of charts on this stuff, but um, it's undeniable that this has been a surprise to the overall market. And again, when you look at the economic surprise, this is just comparing a multitude of factors or multitude of economic data points that uh, compare how the economy is doing relative to the overall expectations. And you can see here, but there's there's four lines on here, uh, the U.S. being the red line. The U.S. is the one that's actually outperforming expectations the most. But very interestingly, it's not just the U.S. that's driving a, a better economic story than was forecasted by economists here in 2024. And if you look at that at the very beginning this year, um, it was kind of in line with expectations. Again, people's expectations are probably set uh, based on uh, some of the behavior we saw in 2023. But notice that we've seen some acceleration. Yes, as of late, there's been a few downticks um, in the Eurozone, a little bit of China. I think some of that is uh, indeed dollar related. Maybe China has bigger issues than just uh, what they had with the dollar. Uh, especially with the, the renminbi fixing last night was one of the lowest levels we've seen in a long time. So in general, this is not just a U.S. story right now of exceeding expectations. 
But undeniably, the U.S. is really the bastion of growth. And as I think through it, uh, if you want to talk about you know the global growth story today, um, the, the linchpin in all of that is the U.S. economy. Uh, if you'd asked me six, seven years ago, um, you know the, the old adage used to be that if the U.S. sneezes, the world catches a cold. I'd have probably told you six or seven years ago that we have to adjust that for maybe China can step in if there is a downturn in the U.S. But I think you know, given the setup here, what we've seen in the post-pandemic world, the debt overhangs from the structural issues within the property and banking sectors within China, um, I don't think that the, the Chinese uh, economy can bail out the rest of the world if the U.S. slips. And so uh, as an investor today, you know, I do think it's very important to focus on the U.S., uh, especially if you get the U.S. right, you're going to get that global growth story correct as well. And so um, we've seen surprises here. And when we look across data, well, what's really driving this? And so uh, Bloomberg puts together um, a, a series that's called the financial conditions within the markets. Um, other uh, investment banks, um, although Bloomberg's not an investment bank, uh, investment banks put out uh, these type of indices as well that try to bring together an uh, uh, amalgamation of various factors and say, uh, does this lead to easing conditions or is it somewhat of a tightening condition? So accommodation versus tightening. And so uh, Bloomberg uh, also publishes its components. Uh, you can see what's driving this. And so uh, the area charts there uh, detail what the contribution from each component is doing. And when you look across these various measures, it says that the market is pretty accommodative today. And so it may not feel like it to a lot of consumers. We've seen a lot of consumer sentiment data, uh, especially on, on last week's report, be pretty negative. Um, I think some of that is the, the cumulative inflation effects that are being felt. And so even though in some instances we're experiencing these cases of disinflation, uh, I think the consumer is comparing things to a pre-pandemic world. And we know that with an, a cumulative inflation rate uh, of north of, you know, if you use CPI, north of roughly 20% now, uh, it's no wonder that, that people feel mired in, in an economic situation uh, that's much worse than what the economic data actually says today. And so this, to me, is one of the biggest challenges that Jay Powell has today, uh, in today or has in today's market. And the idea that the Fed needs to deliver an emergency cut, a preemptive cut, um, just a cut to the overall market, um, I, I would show him this chart today. And I, I was listening to the top where Julia LaRoche had asked me, you know, this that was post the, the Fed press conference at the last FOMC meeting, what I would ask. And I, I would want to show him this chart today. So you tell me that the Fed needs to cut. So you want to make things much more accommodative than we have today. And so um, now there's nothing wrong with having accommodative conditions, but accommodative conditions lead to speculation it leads to in case, some cases excesses. And if that's indeed the case, that leads to higher levels of consumption that could potentially be warranted. And thus, potentially, what that does is that leads to higher inflation, just the antithesis of what the Fed's stated goal is trying to be in that combatant of inflation today. And so for all the talk of tightening um, the hikes having such an impact on the market, what you're seeing here in the financial conditions report is that it is indeed pretty accommodative in today's markets. And again, there's not a lot of pain being felt across markets. Yeah, I, I'd say the bond market quarter to date feels pretty painful. Uh, but in general, what you're seeing is that credit conditions are extremely accommodative in the overall marketplace. Um, so let's talk about some of the underlying economic data. Um, so uh, as we know, we're a service-driven economy, You know, something north of two thirds of the economy is driven by services. Uh, where you know it, it's probably more like 85% when you compare it just to manufacturing. Um, but what we saw was for the first time, uh, and I think it was about 15 months, the uh, PMI data on the manufacturing actually turned to a positive level. And so uh, this is called diffusion index. What it, what it measures is the percentage of respondents of, um, uh, answering in the affirmative. And so this says that more respondents were saying manufacturing was growing or expanding than contracting. And that's something we had not seen really since uh, the hiking cycle had began back in, in early 22. And so um, what this says is that manufacturing appears, again, it's one data point. Uh, folks here at Double I know I, I love to emphasize that one data point doesn't make a trend. Uh, 
uh, two or three start to really put that together. Two draws a line. I like to call three the trend. Uh, but more importantly, the service side still continues to be expansionary. And so uh, I like to look at these two things in, in conjunction with one another because I think you, you, know, you need to have both of these conditions be in that contractionary level for a period of time in order to actually achieve the recession. And so thus far, uh, you're not getting the signals from these PMI surveys. And if you go back in the last summer, or let, let's just call it a year ago, one of my scariest charts was the chart that we show on the screen. And there's two things being, being uh, put here on the chart. I'm also not a huge fan of overlays, but this is not trying to do an overlay. What this is trying to do is show two time series um, uh, against one another. And essentially what I'm showing here is the people uh, that are responding to the CNI surveys um, and talking about they're tightening uh, their lending standards. So again, making it more difficult for access to credit. And then that, that's the orange line. You can see here big upticks the last couple of prints where it seems that there's fewer people that are actually tightening condition, conditions. Now, if you want to take the negative, potentially that says that um, they're already tight to begin with, so they can't really tighten much further. But also, if you look at that blue line, the availability of credit, uh, it was getting pretty scary last year. And it was getting scary because, again, this is where a lot of, uh, a lot of businesses access the market. Uh, if you don't have access to capital markets, this is one, one way of, of getting a loan is going to your local bank. Um, but the level here is kind of somewhat stabilized over the last year or so. And so potentially, this isn't as scary as it was a year ago uh, if things kind of stay in the same levels. But maybe that availability credit comes along with a higher price tag today, be given the interest rate environment. And so I continue to watch this, but um, it's not as scary as it was roughly a year ago. And so there is some good news in, in some of the data that we're seeing. Uh, last week, we got import and export prices along with the various inflation reports. And um, you know, if you follow our work that we like the import and export da data prices because um, what they do is they don't have all these wonky adjustments that economists use. They simply measure the level of prices relative to what's going in and out of the country. And so this is what we call headline. So it includes commodity prices. Um, so what you see here is that our import next prices, um, you know, if you look at the exports, what we're, t what we're sending out um, tends to be pretty accretive. The fact that prices are down a little bit, maybe not as good for those that are producing those goods. But on the import side, a marginal uptake year over year. And that marginal uptick is really driven by energy prices right now. If you strip out um, the, the commodity prices, what you see is this was actually flat year over year. So if Jay Powell wants to hang his hat on one thing, potentially it's that these import prices aren't causing pressure for the, the ability to, to need to raise goods prices. Uh, again, goods prices are also input costs into a lot of things we consume on the service side as well. And what you actually see, though, is if you dig inside the uh, manufacturing and you look at the prices paid, you're seeing that the costs are going up. Now, again, I think some of this is oil related and energy driven at this stage as we have crude oil prices that really have kind of been uh, centered around this $85 price all of a sudden. Um, maybe that's part of the input prices we're seeing here. But unfortunately, these prices paid, they tend to lead to a little bit, they, they tend to lead to higher goods costs. And so uh, what I'll show later on is goods has been a bit deflationary uh, to the overall CPI reports. So this is a thing that maybe Jay Powell doesn't like to see uh, if input cost of goods and manufacturing is indeed going up. Uh, the other thing is, and this was a very scary print uh, about a month or so ago, uh, was the services prices paid. And, and again, if you listen to that top of the hour, uh, something I was talking about on one of the uh, media outlets uh, after the release of this data. And this is also another thing that causes some consternation within the Fed because we know that on a lot of the service input costs, um, they come from the, from the uh, labor component. And so the labor component uh, being more costly, and again, this may be that uptick with some of the minimum wage enactments that we saw earlier in the year. I'll be curious to see what this looks like uh, with California um, increasing its fast food wages to $20 an hour at the beginning of this month. Uh, kind of strange that they only chose the fast food uh, industry. Uh, what's actually very amazing about it now is that the labor unions in California are demanding a $20 minimum wage to everyone now. Why discriminate and only give it to the fast food workers when you can give it to everybody? And so it's something to watch too, 
uh, because typically um, when this dips down below, uh, what you see is that's usually some point in the middle of a recession. And so again, maybe this is just a reversal from some of the data we saw in the previous months. Uh, but again, maybe this is something positive as well. But uh, at this stage, uh, I'm not going to hang my hat on this data and tell it that you know it's going to lead to a, a de de disinflationary trend. So let's get into the CPI data. And this is the challenge that 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 Jay Powell and the Fed have today. And so um, you know I, I know that Jay created something called Supercore. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, this is something that I've liked to look at over many years. Um, and before even the concept was introduced to this idea of Supercore. Because what you see is if you sum up the yellow and the blue areas, that's services inflation. And so if you go back over the last, let's call it, you know, was it 32 years, 33 years there, what you actually see is service inflation is what drives our inflation in the US. Um, during the pan or post pandemic era with the supply chain side, that gray area was driving some level of inflation. Uh, if you notice, really since the, the late 90s, you really only get the goods inflation in that reflationary regime post post uh, recession uh, in 21 it was a post recession reflation but it was exacerbated by the supply chains and the issues we had on, on the global uh, global supply uh, story. So what you see here and, and why I've used this chart for uh, over a decade now is look at the stability of that yellow area. That is what Jay calls supercore now. He technically defined it on PCE, so it's a slightly different composition, but he strips out shelter out of the services component. And why I'd like to use this chart is to show, one, the stability of things that are in services outside the housing market, but also how important the housing component is to our overall level of inflation. And the good news that, that we see here is the shelter inflation or owner's equivalent rent is on a downward trajectory. So this is good. Uh, this is something we've all known because that operates usually with roughly a six quarter lag or so. But the, the problem that you still have is the stability of that yellow area. And so that is the bulk of what people consume within the overall economy uh, when it comes to services. And so from that standpoint, um, Jay has an inflation problem. And this is what you've seen with the latest prints. Uh, and unfortunately, as I said, the three uh, three data points does indeed make a trend. And if you annualize that now, the last three data points are showing a number north of 4.5% when it comes to the core inflation number. Um, Jay Powell was out today. Uh, if you didn't see that, he was he was uh, up in Canada talking about this. And he said the data is not corroborative for a rate cut right now when it comes to the inflation data. So the bond market sniffed that out very early last week and said, well, maybe we got a little too... Uh, jubilant about the market, thinking rate cuts were coming, and maybe indeed this economy can actually hold this, hold on to this a bit longer. And so Jay invented the word uh, supercore, uh, and he was looking at it because it was giving him the, the directionality he needed, um, and it pulled out this kind of sticky component, uh, that, or a very lag component at least, of the inflation, and that is the shelter side. Now, there's a good news and a bad news to this chart. The good news is the way that Jay Powell defined Supercore, he defined on PCE. And if you notice, even with the most recent print, what you actually see is that that number is in the downward trajectory. So good job, Jay, for picking out the, the data point that was going to give you a, a strong story. However, over the last couple of years, Jay's really been focused on CPI. And CPI is kind of how the market thinks about inflation. It's how the tips market is indeed priced. But what you find within that is it's going absolutely the wrong direction right now. And so I think he may regret a little bit about talking, one, about CPI, made this idea about super core, but this is not corroborative of data that the Fed is looking for in order to deliver a cut. And so I, I've been talking to clients over the last couple of weeks, and I said the one risk that I thought was underpriced in the market was that there would be no potential Fed cuts in 2024. Now, it wasn't a forecast saying that the Fed wasn't going to cut. This was even before last week's CPI print, but it's sure looking more and more difficult. In fact, the price in the market today barely has a little bit over one cut left in the market right now. Now, obviously, pricing can change. We have still another you know, eight plus months of data uh, before the end of the year, 
But Jay and their willingness to want to cut and their desire to cut that still doesn't mean that they have the data to corroborate that. And as I also said, I'm very concerned about all of this because if indeed they, they cut a little bit too early and given what ris rallies we've seen across financial markets, and I'm not looking about you know just the last few weeks and some of the pain we've seen in bonds, but let's go back to the middle of October when the 10-year hit 5%, um, you've had a very strong rally. We've seen it in speculative assets such as gold, Crypto, obviously stocks are up. Small caps were doing quite well until this latest kind of rate push as well. And so what you find there is that if they indeed cut too early, it could lead to more speculation, leading to more of the wealth effect and leading to a higher level of inflation. So what is driving a lot of this? Well, it's obviously the US consumer. And you know, potentially one thing to look at is look at the labor market. And one thing about uh, our fellow Americans is that they like to consume, um, and they do so as long as they stay uh, with an income source. And that income source typically comes from labor. And so what you kind of look at this chart here, you could argue that the unemployment rate is in, a, is in an uptrend uh, after getting as low as 3.4%. The latest read was about 3.8%. or was 3.8%. But if you kind of take a look at everything, uh, what you see is that it's been a pretty low unemployment environment. Now, I know there's criticisms of the unemployment rate, there's criticism of a lot of the data, but just taking the data at, at face value, uh, it sure doesn't argue that the Fed indeed needs to cut. And so if the inflation is not corroborative for a rate cut, what, what the Fed would probably need to see is a deterioration in, in the labor market. And I think if you saw an unemployment rate north of 4%, call it 4.1, 4.2%, I think that could have the Fed want to deliver a, a somewhat of an emergency type cut, just even with a kind of more stubbornish type of inflation rate. So uh, again, I don't want to see the, labor, uh, the unemployment rate go up because that means our fellow Americans are losing jobs and they go from 3.8 to 4.2, um, that would be a loss of probably 650 to 700,000 jobs. It's a meaningful amount of people especially if it's you who indeed loses their jobs. But the good news about the labor market, if you look at the job opening and labor trend survey or the JOLTS data, what you see is that we have a very stable level of, of kind of job openings out there. Great news is, is that there's, there's fewer job openings there used to be. Um, that's a lot of that is because of the employment, and I'll show that in a couple of charts. Um, but what you look at that blue line and you look at the job openings, notice how elevated it still is to the history over the previous 20 years. And so this is a market that is looking to employ more people. Now, what those jobs look like, I don't have any idea whether they're part-time, full-time, high paying, blue collar, white collar, whatever that may be, but there definitely are people looking for uh, people to do work for them. Um, if you look at the unemployed, yes, that's, that's went up a little bit, but there's still a big gap between uh, the, the people that are unemployed and looking for work, which is measured by that orange line and that blue line, which says the, uh, how many people are actually, or how many jobs are actually out there. At the bottom, we put on the job opening rate. Notice, still pretty elevated pre, uh, relative to pre-pandemic level. But notice the hiring rate and the quit rate are pretty much stable with what we saw prior to the pandemic. And so it seems like it's a more normalized rate in terms of the amount of people were able to onboard with jobs, that's the higher rate. Um, it's not the great, um, I, I'm, the, the phrase is uh, escaping me right now, but oh, the great resignation uh, that people talked about in 21 and 22, um, where people aren't quitting their jobs as much, but that job opening rate is still elevated. And so there's something about the overall economy that we're not filling the amount of roles that, that people need when it comes to work. And so um, if you want to take a different look at the kind of job picture, and this comes from the household survey, uh, not the establishment survey. So the establishment is what we call the non-farm payrolls. Um, but if you look at the household survey, it talks about people that are uh, fully employed. They're employed part-time for economic reasons, right? That's usually something negative, like you lost your job, you're doing part-time work. But then there's also people working part-time for non-economic reasons. Maybe they choose that. Uh, maybe they want to spend more time at home. Maybe they enjoyed during the pandemic uh, 
of having um, you know more free time as well. Um, maybe they just want to work 36 hours a week and not be defined as full time. But notice there that the part time for non economic reasons has been very strong uh, in the an additional side. So uh, a lot of uh, economists would argue this is not a good sign that there's part time jobs and not full time jobs. But when you look at it, that's it's it's done for non economic reasons. Um, you know, maybe it's not as negative as we think. So again, um, we we work around a lot of uh, the bond markets. We tend to focus on things in a more negative light. So um, I'm just trying to to point out that maybe things aren't as bad as we think they they really are. And if you look at the labor force, this looks very negative. And so if you look at the the trend growth. Um, our labor force is greater than it was. So these are U.S. citizens, the U.S. civilian labor force. And so this is why when I was saying if we get a 40 basis point increase in overall rates, it's probably 650 to 700,000 job losses because I'm looking at the size of the labor force. But notice what you see here in this trend line since the 14 to 19 experience, that we really haven't filled the gap of expectations, right? We have a growing economy, we have a growing population, and thus we need to have a growing workforce. And we seem to be stabilized around 168 million jobs. And so this is this is what you see here. But there is one positive in this, and that our foreign-born labor force has really accelerated. In fact, it's actually above trend. And so if you look at the gap on the previous slide, you know, it's it's about two million people, which you expect. But look at where we're kind of overshooting that. It's about a million and a half or so. So in general, we need more workers. That's what the JOLTS data is saying uh, to us. And maybe what it is, is we need better H1, HB1 visa programs. Maybe we need to encourage people to move to this great country and be able to, uh, to try to fill some of the gap in these jobs. And so, again, this is not a, not a talk about you know, um, the, the um, illegal situation or anything going on here. But just knowing the job openings we have, we need people to be able to do that. And so this is what the jobs data picture is telling me. And so um, I've seen a lot of criticisms about birth death models, you know, part time, full time. So what I, I think about is another way to kind of get a better real time monitoring of the labor situation. And what I like to look at is unemployment claims. Now, unemployment gates also is fraught with some uh, challenges. Um, because again, if you if you get laid off from a job and you uh, get some form of severance, you're actually not allowed to file a, uh, unemployment claims out there. Um, maybe some people do. Maybe indeed there's some people doing false claims out there. But I think what's very important here, and I, I like to survey people around the desk. I talk to a lot of people in general, and I ask them, well, if you lost your job, would you be shy about going to get unemployment benefits? And usually the answer is no. I paid into the system, I want my money, right? It's kind of like how people think about social security. And so what you see in the continuing jobless claims um, and the initial claims out there, they've really stabilized. And so this doesn't look like an overall weakening economy. Now, again, maybe there's people that are sitting on four, six, nine, 12 months of severance out there. Uh, doesn't seem to me that common. And maybe that's potentially why this number is still low. But if you look at that continuing claims number, We've had a little bit higher peaks. And again, this isn't because of a distorted scale. Uh, we got to about you know 1.85 million in continuing claims, and we said about 1.81 today. Um, so in general, there seems to be this transition from people that are unemployed getting back into the labor force, um, at least from this perspective. And so um, again, this is something I like to watch for more real time uh, when it comes to the labor market. And so to me, it feels like uh, the labor market is still somewhat intact. And if that's the case, that means the economy is intact as well. And you look at wage growth. Yes, it's decelerating. Um, it's only growing in the 4% range, whether you use um, average hourly earnings or you use uh, the Atlanta Fed wage tracker, which tries to control for uh, some of the differences in the composition of the labor market. But what you see in both of these charts is they're really above the levels we've seen for the last 20 plus years. And yeah, the Atlanta Fed number was a little bit higher. Um, average hourly earnings, you got to go back almost 40 years to get higher than today's levels. And so to me, this is another reason why Jay Powell keeps harping on the wage growth data is not consistent with a 2% inflation. And I think he's right. Um, you know why? These levels are driving uh, this wage growth is 
driving a level of inflation that is above 2%. And so this is another reason why I think the Fed has to be patient and waiting for the data in order to deliver what the market wants, and that is that first rate cut. Um, so let's look at the consumer. Um, so uh, a lot of people scratched their heads during the pand uh, post-pandemic, said this isn't tenable, there's too much free money, there's too much liquidity sloshing around the system. But here's another perspective as well. So in addition to the unemployment rate, um, what you have on the chart in the blue line is the ratio of net worth to disposable income. And this is very important because disposable income has been relatively higher, but also notice this wealth effect. Um, this is from asset owners, right? Markets have done quite well over the last few years. Um, if you're a homeowner, right, uh, property prices have done extremely well. And so maybe even though people um, aren't generating as much income as they were a few years back, uh, maybe it's this wealth effect component that uh, Mr. Bernanke used to talk about, that Jen and Yellen harped on. Even Jay's talked about it uh, now and again. Maybe that's part of what's going on out there. And so the consumer, when it look, when you look at kind of their asset side of the equation, looks very strong. And then also, if you took a look at it and you looked at the liability side, especially those that are highly concentrated in home ownership and have low mortgage rates, um, the servicing that debt is some of the lowest levels we've seen, uh, you know, really in the last 30 years or so. And so maybe this is part of the reason why the economy remains resilient, even with interest rate levels we haven't seen in, in roughly 17 years. Uh, the kind of bad news is that the saving rate has indeed diminished. Now, obviously, we got distorted during the pandemic. Um, if, if, uh, if the government gives you money and sends it to you and you can't go out, uh, you deposit in the bank account, you, you maybe uh, open up an online trading account. But what you see here is that it's kind of a bit disconcerting that the, that the savings rate is below where we were in that kind of post-GSC pre-pandemic trend. Uh, good news is it's been an uptick you know, since, since 2022. Uh, that's probably enticed a little bit by higher deposit rates. Um, for those of you that have savings accounts, uh, maybe you should uh, look to opening a money market account as well. Uh, they have significantly higher yields. Um, but also, this is a, the savings rate as a percentage of disposable income. So this isn't the level of savings out there. So this doesn't tell you that people are drawing from their savings. What it says is how much they're actually saving as a percentage of disposable income. So that's a little disconcerting potentially, but uh, in general, maybe it's because they're, they're paying down debt. Um, so the, the bad side of the equation is the delinquencies on the consumer side. And what you see here is that for the various consumer products outside of student loans, we're seeing meaningful upticks in delinquency rate. Uh, if you look at auto loans today, uh, auto loans are kind of back to levels we saw entering the 08, area, uh, 08 era. You look at mortgage loans, um, they are an uptick, but by the way, they're lower than they were going into the pandemic. So maybe that's not as big an issue, but you are seeing credit card delinquencies really go up in a measured way. And also what I look at, I look at when was the last time we were at these levels? Well, maybe this has to do something with the overall interest rate level. So maybe what's happened here is that it's that higher minimum payment. It's a higher amount that's being paid on these credit card balances that's driving that as well. But I guess the positive attribute here to say is that, you know, it, it is consistent with kind of those recessionary environments. Um, that, that's not what I'm saying is positive. But maybe indeed because of some of this wealth effect uh, that there is some, some other attributes there. Now, if I look at this and I say, okay, what's going on here? If you actually dig under the hood, what you see is this is driven uh, significantly by the lower income and the lower FICO cohorts. And so talking to some of our um, folks on the ABS desk and some folks on the desk today, you know, they're talking about, well, given the amount of stimulus, it drove some FICO scores up. So maybe people who weren't supposed to get access to some of these products did, and now you see that tightening behavior, right, where the uh, availability of credit is going down. And so maybe there's some stress in the system because of that as well. So we'll have to see how this plays out. But it, this is one of the more negative charts that I have out there and definitely something the team has its eye on. But lest you not forget, the amount of, of money spending and money printing that took place um, in the post-pandemic era, it was just unprecedented. 
In fact, M2 growth was like, I think uh, year over year it peaked like 28%, um, which is crazy to really think about that we increased money supply, the amount outstanding by 28% in one given year. And so a lot of monetarists were calling for recession because the money supply was, was dwindling meaningfully. But I think what's missed is looking at kind of the longer term trend. And if you look at a longer term trend, that still says there's significant liquidity that was injected into the system and it remains out there. In fact, just put this in perspective of how much above trend we still are. I mean, roughly if the monetary base should be closer to 18 trillion, when indeed today it's just inside of $21 trillion. Pretty, pretty insane. And so I think this is part of why you've seen uh, the behavior in financial markets like you've seen. And maybe this is why we're still some, we feel a wash in liquidity in the marketplace. Well, the liquidity has to come from somewhere, and it came from our good friends at the government. So hopefully everyone did their civic duty yesterday and paid their fair share or what the government deems to be your fair share out there. But um, the budget deficit um, really got, it got exploded during the pandemic. Um, and we, we've done a couple more douses of it as well. And so for all the growth we've had in the country, in fact, last year's nominal GDP was 5.9%. It eerily is exactly the same number as the budget deficit as a percent of GDP. So uh, maybe indeed it is that M2 growth. Maybe it is that monetization out there uh, that was driving a lot of it. So as we like to say, the Fed hikes until something breaks. And so it's not very common for you to get a Fed cut. So what this shows is the hiking cycle in perspective uh, for the last seven hiking cycles, uh, what it looks like. And then uh, what we do is we, we take the, the rate and show just how long it stayed at that level before the first cut. So if you look at the 87 experience, they cut. Well, they cut because of, of essentially uh, the, the, the Black, uh, Black Monday uh, crash in the marketplace. So they had to cut it imminently. But notice there, this higher for longer mantra, maybe it's not higher for longer. Maybe it's just higher in kind of more normalish conditions. In fact, yes, the Fed is, is kind of paused at the hiking cycle at this point. Um, you know, they're two years into the hiking cycle now. Uh, they've been on pause since July of last year. Um, but I think that this line is probably going to look something closer to that yellow line experience where the Fed is not in a hurry to cut rates. And so uh, let us not forget that it's not just that as soon as the Fed hits terminal and hits that peak rate, that ultimately they start cutting. And so that's the reminder here that I think the Fed doesn't, the Fed historically doesn't really deliver an insurance cut out there uh, into the marketplace. Even years like 94, uh, they tried to stay elevated before they had to deliver that first cut. And notice the 87, 88, they did the cut because of the Black, um, the Black Monday uh, crash in the market. But they went back to hiking back in the next year. So again, it's usually something breaking in the system that drives that. It's not just out of the goodness of their overall heart. Um, and because of the debt burden, the average interest rate is rising. Uh, this is just the outstanding debt of Treasury. I bring this up to say that, well, if we're going to stay higher for longer, we're just going to stay at these rates, um, it's going to cause more and more problems to the overall U.S. government. And so what I like to point out once again is that the interest burden is really growing in a meaningful manner. In fact, we're north of 3.5% of GDP at this point, and we now um, are uh, the current expenditures on interest rate are over a trillion dollars a year. And so uh, people like to overlay this with defense. Uh, I stole this from Jim Bianco. Uh, he always likes to talk about this, or he has over the last 18 months or so. And the reason we point that out is defense is one of those kind of mandatory type things. So, so is interest, by the way. You've got to pay that or you end up defaulting on it as well. So this is problematic. And it's what I like to say is it's not a problem until it is. And one day it will become a problem. I just don't think it's a problem in 2024. Uh, but there is one other problem with this high interest rate regime, and it's loans to small businesses. And so we showed that NFIB survey earlier on about um, the overall kind of tightness of credit, the willingness to lend. But you see here that the rate is pretty expensive. And I I'm actually shocked the average rate is this low. And why I say that is that 
typically when, when small businesses borrow, they borrow at something called the prime rate. And the prime rate is 300 basis points over Fed funds, which is eight and a half today. I'm shocked that the spread's only 130 basis points on average. So I, I would actually expect this number to be a bit higher. And, and maybe the, the banks are being generous, one, because they, they needed to try to generate some revenue. But secondly, maybe they bought into the mantra that the Fed was going to cut rates. And so they believed in it. They just wanted to get these loans on the books. And, and again, this is the highest level we've seen in, over, in the past decade. This has to go into prices, has to go about thinking and things. And maybe this is why we haven't seen a meaningful increase and in expansion in small businesses. So um, that's kind of the macro environment. Let's talk about what's happened in markets real quick. As most of you are probably are well aware, over the last couple of years, bond market volatility has been the most dominant theme. Um, if you look, you see the spike on that blue line. The blue line is the, um, is the move index or the options implied volatility of the treasury market. Um, and notice that we have now, it looked like we were decelerating. And all of a sudden, with this new inflation data, we're starting to get a choppy environment again. That's why you're feeling some pain in the bond market is because of this increased volatility. And if you take a look at the scoreboard uh, through yesterday, through tax day, uh, what you see here is really um, the losers this year were winners last year. Uh, this is kind of the rate side of the equation, high quality assets. Um, the, the winner here, hands down, has been uh, non-agency CMBS, especially the riskier parts of it. And if you look at the other, other winners here have been kind of speculative assets such as EMFI, uh, the lowest quality um, in the CLO, or the lowest investment grade quality in the CLO market, um, the lowest quality in the loan market, but also most of those are actually floating rate exposures. And so it's been duration has not been your friend year to date um, because rates are up on a year to date basis. In fact, uh, the low of the year was the first trade uh, was was back in January this year. And so looking at credit, it's a perfect example. Far right hand side, worst performers are the highest quality assets. Again, they tend to be a bit longer in duration. The best performers were the ones that were really banged up last year, like commercial mortgages but also the more speculative assets, the mezzanine CLOs, the loan market, um, you know, again, even, even and, then, and then some of the floating rate assets of the other posit. Look at a high yield there. For all that yield, you've, you have a, a whole 10 basis points of performance on a year-to-date basis thus far. And hands down, the driver of this has been interest rates. And so um, going over this with some of the analysts this morning, uh, a comment was, man, these charts sure look the same. Um, yeah, because that's what a rising rate environment looks like. Uh, I, I did point out that the two years sure has a much different trough to it uh, than the rest of them. But we're definitely at new highs of the year, not new highs in the cycle. Um, and it sure feels like we're talking strategy this morning here. Sure feels like we're going to try to test some of those levels. Uh, that said, everybody thinks so. So usually when everybody thinks so, we may not get there. But it definitely, uh, it definitely, it, there's a lot of momentum in the market right now, and it's creating a good opportunity for those that are patient to be able to really nibble at some of these kind of new elevated yield levels we haven't seen in about six months or five months or so. It's also interesting is the twos tens curve being inverted, uh, one of the largest ones on record. Uh, we keep setting a new record. I, I have a feeling this is going to be longer than 93 weeks uh, when we update it next week. Um, but what you'll find, uh, it'll be at the end of this week, uh, given the inversion right now, it sure feels like um, that's where we're going to be. And so people keep saying the yield curve, the yield curve, the yield curve. This says the Fed has to cut. Well, maybe the Fed doesn't have to cut. Maybe the back end of the curve has just been too negative on the overall market. Um, so uh, time will tell here. Uh, but again, this is something where you're in uncharted territory. Uh, the bond market is starting to wake up to inflation again. Uh, Five-year break-evens have definitely been on an up, uh, upward trajectory. Uh, this means also that real yields, um, you know, again, with the rise in this, this has been a little bit of a rise in real yields as well. So it's been inflation break-evens and real yields. But the bond market is starting to say maybe Jay and company don't really achieve their 2% target as quickly as we thought that they may. Notice that prior to the, uh, the pandemic, 2% was somewhat kind of the ceiling. Now it definitely appears to be that the market feels that's more of a floor than ultimately the ceiling.
Japan. This latest move up in yields definitely has caused strength in the dollar. Uh, so the dollar's kind of flirting again with some of the highs we've seen over the last year or so. Um, I'll remind everyone that high that we saw uh, in the dollar last year was around the high in interest rates here in the U.S. last year. Um, and, you know, the gap there is essentially um, what we're needing to do to fill um, that on, on the rates curve as well. And so uh, potentially, I think we get back to those levels. I think it's going to create a good buying opportunity out there. But in general, uh, there is going to be a time where you're going to want to step in and buy a little bit more duration. And so uh, looking back to the yield on the ag, I like to use this as a barometer for thinking about the overall market, roughly a 525 yield. It'll be at least that today uh, with the move up in yields today. Um, but one thing about that, when you throw off a, a yield and income north of 5% <clears throat> and you have a duration that's around 6%, that means you can withstand you know, something around an 85 basis point move or so before you actually have a capital depreciation that offsets uh, the yield that you generate. Um, you know, colloquially, people have called that the Sherman ratio around here. It's, it's from a joke I made one day, but I do like to think about it from that perspective because that yield per unit duration tells us how much rates can rise and we have enough income to offset that. But notice this too, if we get back to the yield levels where we were, let's just say, you know, seven, eight months ago, you're talking about double digits. Again, I said seven or eight months ago. I meant to say back at the beginning of the year. Um, but you get returns that are back in the double digits. So even though there's been some pain in, in the bond markets thus far, I remind everyone, look back over the last like six months or so, uh, you've still done quite well. And by the way, you don't need yields to rally to make money here. And where we are kind of in on the charts today, if you went back to those rate charts, you would see that, again, we're kind of near the upper end of those ranges, which I feel like those are those are maybe tested, but I do think, indeed, they probably hold absent some acceleration in inflation. So let's take a look at what the markets have been offering over the last 10 years. So these bar charts show us the range of yields. Uh, the, the blue uh, dot shows you what the average has been. Uh, that gray triangle tells us what you earn today. And notice the numbers of five, six, seven, eight, nines on the board. There's money to be made in fixed income. And so uh, although we look at things in a, in a Barclays aggregate perspective, owning things outside of Barclays aggregate still offers some compelling opportunities. Yes, high yield corporate bond spreads are tight, um, but we've heard a lot from our teams that people are just buying yield. Well, all those people that love that 775 yield, you must love it at 820. The problem is, is that that premium or that spread that you get in addition to treasuries is indeed quite low. And I'll put that into context in a minute. But there are still parts of the market. Um, you know, one of my favorite trades coming in the year was to fade the forward curve. I didn't believe that the Fed would deliver six cuts this year, absent some uh, significant decline in the overall economy. Um, and again, floating rate assets have been very strong performers. And if you're a risk taker and you want to buy the lower end uh, of the quality spectrums out there and you want to traffic in these securities that are kind of in that below investment grade, uh, you know, kind of that lower tier, there's equity type yields out there in the marketplace. And so um, for those that are risk seeking out there, um, you know, look, I wouldn't load a portfolio up with triple C bank loans. I, I want to have a team that's analyzing the credits, that's taking a lot of idiosyncratic risk. Um, I want to marry this with a few things out there. But there's still ways to build portfolios out there that aren't really junky that can generate seven and eight types of yields today. So I like to remind folks that we, we spend a lot of time looking at treasuries, we look at T-bills, things like that. There still are some, uh, some pretty healthy yields out there in the marketplace. The bad news is, if you look at spreads over the last 10 years, um, in some instances, they are, by, by historical standards the last 10 years, extremely tight. Uh, so what this does is this looks at, uh, at the, oh, uh, the spreads in various areas of the marketplace. It compares them to where they rank today relative to their 10-year history. And again, it's looking at those on a daily basis. And so you can see that there's still parts of the market that are above median over the last 10 years. There are things like non-agency mortgages, things like non-agency commercial mortgages, uh, loans, loans because they're indeed floating rate. Um, you know, uh, people are worried about some of the uh, payments there. That loan number is a little distorted by that triple C market as well. But notice that in the upper left, agency mortgages. 
Uh, agency mortgages are in the top decile of cheapness. They've been in spread. Um, they they are dependent on market volatility as well, and some of that 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 uh, vol we've seen there, and also losing two major buyers from the banks as well as the Fed, has caused some pain there. I remind you, those are government guaranteed mortgages as well. It's no doubt uh, why we like that part of the market. When I can buy a government guaranteed asset that's in its top decile of cheapness over the last 10 years, and I juxtapose that against like emerging market corporate bonds, which obviously have meaningfully more risk out there, and I only get about 100 basis point of pickup, I'm looking at the horizontal axis there, uh, which says that it's near one of the tightest levels we've seen on, on the EMFI corporate bonds uh, really at that point in the si uh, at the, this point in the last 10 years. And so um, I don't like when people say I'm a yield buyer. Uh, I like to be compensated for every single risk that I take. I want to be compensated for my treasury risk. I want to build my building blocks of risk premia out there. And so at the end of the day, spread still does matter. And so that's the way we're thinking about it here at Double Line. <laughs>